If you believe that God always talks the way you talk, then you created God in your image, which makes you a God, a little G-God, not the God. Image. Image is everything. That's what we've been told, right? But why do we... Why do we create images? So that's what we do. We, we create images. Our art is creating images. How many, how many have a, a bust in, in your home? Does anybody have a bust? I've got, I've got busts. I've got paintings. How many have painting in your home? You've, you've got art. Sculpture. I love to watch the artists make the sculptures. I love the, the landscapes. I love the paintings of historical buildings, the portraits that we have hanging in our homes, the photographs of our loved ones, memories that are preserved, places. And those things are displayed in prominent places so we can notice them. We can admire them. You go to a museum and the most expensive pieces are behind ropes. All the lights are shining on the art that has been made. The images that have been created. So they can be noticed. In the 21st century, there's lots of image online. We have social media influencers, and that's a whole you could do an entire four-year degree on social media and social media influencers. And I would have never dreamed that things would be the way they are now. Lots of money spent to become influencers. And that can I don't see anything wrong with that. Just like anything else, you can take it the wrong way and you can use it for your own glory instead of God's glory. If I became a social media influencer, if I spent tons of money, if I commissioned an artist to make statues of Jason Banks, just place them all over the world, just build me a thousand statues, put them at every major city and every city square. people would notice me. They would know me. Because image is everything. But we're created in God's image to communicate and reflect who He is. His grace. Remember we talked about last week Him being the person of grace? And to show what He's like. We're, we're supposed to be a mirror image. But what happens when we flip the mirror around onto ourselves? We're the reflection in the mirror and we're exposing the, the back side or the black side of that mirror to God. And when we hold that mirror up in the wrong direction, the only thing that can happen is it will cast a shadow on the ground. And we fall in love with ourselves, the little g gods. Go ahead and stand with me, if you will. And let's read the Word of God together this morning. I'm over in Hebrews, Hebrews 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in the time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by the Son. And that doesn't mean 
now. The writer of Hebrews is talking about the last days of the Old Covenant leading up to the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. When we had by himself purged our sins, set down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. You this morning have inherited a more excellent name when you took up on the mantle, child of God. Son of God, daughter of God. So that is something to rejoice about this morning. Because like we said, like Jill said, God has not left you behind. You are not here by accident. You are here as a child of God to say, I am a kingdom builder. Amen. 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 Let's go ahead and pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for what you've already done, Lord, in this place. The lives that you've changed this morning, we thank you for it. We know that we are going to see great things. We're going to see a move of God in our hearts and then in our communities. We thank you. In Jesus' name. You can be seated. Amen. So... Jill and I got to go out of town yesterday, and we went to Cincinnati to see uh, Nate Bergazzi. You know the comedian, Nate Bergazzi? Go ahead and show the, his picture there. So, I have, according to Jill, a toxic trait, and that is being early to things. <laughs> So we went to Cincinnati, and it was at the Heritage Bank Center. It sits in between the the stadiums, and ultimately there were around 10,000 people there. But we were there really early. And I'm like, I have to go to the restroom. I'm going to get some of those uh, candy-covered pecans. that They do that on purpose. You can smell that outside the stadium. And and she said, give me a bottle of water. I'm like, yep, yep, yep. So... I end up walking around trying to find that the the candy nut place was right there. But somehow I ended up, all the entrances look the same. (laughs) All the seats look the same. You have the exact same view. The stage was in the center, okay? So I get lost. But anyways, long story short, this lady, she says something to me. and And of course I don't hear it. So, so I'm like, what is it? And she goes, you look like him. <laughs> and, and she goes, has anybody ever told you that? And I said, well, not today. <laughs> and she said, but you're not him, right? I said, said no, no, I'm not him. So I went back, and I was, I was laughing, and, and, and I told Jill what happens, and she, she says, she says, you have went from Ryan Gosling to Nate Bergazzi. Because <laughs> before I got gray here and gray here and I was about 15 years younger, I couldn't go many places with someone didn't tell me you look like Ryan Gosling. I didn't know who he was at the time. I looked him up and one of the articles said he was hired for the movie The Notebook because he wasn't conventionally handsome. So... <laughs> I went from Ryan to Nate really, really fast. But what happened? She thought I was somebody that I wasn't. But what if in someone's time... You can take Nate down. He's had his time. Okay? What would happen if we walked into the room in the service of someone else and they looked at you and said, Are you him? Are you him? Because I can't see this. But what I can see is your service. What I can see is the anointing. What I can see is the Holy Ghost all over you. Are you him? Here and now. 
Let's talk about here and now. My concern is that we as a congregation grow spiritually. That we grow, that my family grows, that my marriage grows, my business grows spiritually. That the kingdom of God is advanced because if those things grow, then that means the kingdom of God advances. And there's lots of talk, and there's been lots of talk in this country about saving Christianity. But I don't think Christianity needs to be saved. It's doing pretty well on its own. Because there's nothing that can come against what this movement is. Because it was started by Him. And there's lots of talks about losing rights and losing freedoms. My concern isn't so much about that. My concern is that I, that we demonstrate the posture of the Holy Spirit in bearing His spiritual gifts. Because when we do that, everything else falls in line. And I don't want to get that backwards. We're to seek His kingdom first. The Word of God says, but seek His kingdom first. Seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That's not a promise that's far off. It's not some futuristic event. It's here and now. Jesus Christ spoke more on the topic of the kingdom of God more frequently than anything else. So it must be important. And Jesus Christ was and is the embodiment of the kingdom of God. So whose kingdom are we helping build more frequently? Our kingdom? A worldly system? A worldly system is a system that is an over system. The kingdom of God is an under system. And that doesn't mean that, we, that it's trampled underfoot or anything like that. But the way that we achieve power, the way that you get things done in the world is by lording over. But we're made in His image. When we turn that around, that mirror reflects Jesus Christ and Him as a servant. The Word says, whoever abides in Him ought to walk just as He walked. So... I'm thinking about this. If we're His body, which we're His body, right? We're His body here on earth. Then we should submit to Him in everything just like our body submits to our brain. It's why we're in this corporate fast because we want our flesh to answer to our spirit minds, right? If we're dwelling on Him, if we're seeking Him. So if you look at that, and plainly speaking, we're His second body here on earth. So it's obvious that we should continue doing what He did and doing it now, which is speaking the kingdom of God. How many opportunities do you have to speak the kingdom of God into someone's life? If you work a job, if you have a family, if you're around anyone in any situation... You can speak the kingdom of God into their life. So what's God up to in the world today? I'm glad you asked me, Pastor Wells, because I'm going to share. Is he just out to see somebody pray a sinner's prayer? Is he just out to see that we follow a set of instructions just so we can... Avoid hell? Is it just gathering a group of people together that believe the right things? Is it just so he can bless us financially? So we can build our own empires? I believe what he's up to is calling a group of people together that embodies the kingdom of God here and now. Are you him? It's funny how that works. I had this message earlier this week and then that happened yesterday.
embodying the kingdom of God. Individually, corporately speaking and walking in the reality of the kingdom here and now. Manifesting the reality of a sovereign God who reigns over a sovereign kingdom. There's no place for anything else. He is sovereign. I mean, the only glory is to Him and for Him. His sovereignty. Kingdom living is difficult. It's a sacrifice. But you remember what Paul said? Jesus didn't cling to His divine status, but rather He emptied Himself entered into solidarity with us, fallen humanity, he became a humble, what? Servant. And though he was rich, for our sake, he became poor. So in other words, instead of exercising his divine right, he instead became a social and religious outcast. Think about the system. You can read history. You can obviously read the Bible and learn of the systems that were in place before Jesus Christ came on the scene. And when He came on the scene, it was beyond radical. It was something that was a fulfillment of prophecy, yet still brand new. That's why we have to be careful with the thus saith the Lord's. I don't need a thus saith the Lord if it doesn't line up completely with this. I don't want it. Don't say it to me. Don't say it around me. You can judge these things. It's okay to judge these things. It's okay to look at someone who's made something outrageous and say, well, it's been some time past. That didn't happen. And again, I'm not going to publicly expose or say these things about these other... There's, there's whole... I mean, you go on Instagram, there's whole ministries that are designed around tearing down other people's ministries. I'm not interested in that. That's not what God has called me to do. If anything, I should go by the word of God and approach that person personally with with other believers. Bridget, Pastor Wells, let's go talk to so-and-so. Let's figure out why they're in error instead of blasting it for the world to hear. It makes us look like idiots. Like we can't can't get along. We're we're right. Everybody else is wrong. So let's let's just call it out. Let's, I'm just gonna. I'm bold, son. I'm gonna call it out like it is. No, you're just a jerk. Well, the gospel's offensive, is it? Is the is 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 this offensive? This is gospel. It's so offensive because here's what the gospel is. Let me. Let me. Wash your feet. How can I serve you today? What can I do for you that hasn't been done? That's not offensive. That's the gospel. Service. Sacrifice. John Howard Yoder in the book, The Politics of Jesus... Not Amish, by the way. In his book, The Politics of Jesus, said Jesus... And I'm going to read it. Jesus could have chosen the untrammeled exercise of sovereign power in the affairs of that humanity amid which he came to dwell, but instead he renounced it and took on the most humble title, servant. See, he could have exercised unlimited power. All over those political and religious systems of the world, but instead... He served them. Now listen to me. Listen to me this morning. The punishment that was executed on Jesus by those he came to serve was 
murder. Politics and religion killed Jesus Christ. If you want to look at it for what it is, that's what killed Jesus Christ. It should be a lesson. That should be a lesson for us. That we are members of a sovereign kingdom. Serving under, not over. Let's talk about the state of the kingdom. Presidents get to talk about the state of the nation. The governors get to talk about the state of the state. Which just means I'm going to drain you of more of your income that you've worked so hard to get. True. The state of the kingdom. So there's a study that's released every, every year. It's called the Global Peace Index. And it ranks the top ten most peaceful countries in the world. This, this is fascinating. So it evaluates a total of 23 Indicators and it compiles a list and it's categorized in three categories. Is that correct? It's categorized, it's categorized in three militarization, safety, security, and domestic and international conflict, all one category. So, how effective are we in the kingdom? Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. So here's the top 10 most peaceful countries. Can you guess who number 10 is? Just guess. Just say it. Switzerland. This is number 10. Japan, Slovenia, Portugal, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Denmark. And you want to guess the number one most peaceful? How'd you know that? <laughs> Susan, do, do you play the lottery? <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's right, it's Iceland. Really? Oh, that is fascinating. Are they peaceful? <laughs> Uncle Don Susan? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I did some research, aside from the uh, Global Peace Index, and I looked up the top ten countries with the highest total number of Christians. You guess what number ten is? Anybody? China. Number ten. There's a whole world out there. I don't let the talking heads define my view of the world I live in or the future I'm going to experience for myself, the kingdom of God, and my children. Let that be a lesson. Ethiopia, Italy, the Congo, Russia, Philippines, Nigeria, Mexico, Brazil, And can you guess number one? The United States of America. So not one, not one country listed in the top ten peaceful nations of the world are on the same list as the top ten countries with the highest number of born-again Christians. Or Christians, period. From every denomination. Not one. How effective are we in the kingdom of God? We live in a fallen world until Jesus returns. It's going to be dangerous. There's going to be wars. There's going to be crimes. There's going to be violence. But we, as Christians, should be our community's first defense. This house should be a house of sovereignty and of grace. We should pray for all People, all people, if we support the people of Israel in prayer and not the people of Gaza, we are in error. Because if you pray for one side in any conflict and not the other, I don't believe personally that God 
hears your prayers. Over the past 3,400 years, humans have been at peace for 268 years. That's only 8% of recorded history that this planet has been at peace. And this includes after the Prince of Peace came. Well, my God told me, Jesus Christ, he, He came to bear the sword, brother. This right here is not a sword to cut you or anybody else down. It is a building block. It is a sword to build you up. Because if you are equipped with what is in this book, we are to give more reverence to what is said here than the book itself. But this book has been sent to us to build us up so we can build the kingdom of God. It is not a sword to cut you down. It is spiritual abuse to be cut, 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 cut. I believe that if you're in sin this morning, that my Holy Spirit is big enough to convict you of that sin. People say, you need to preach more about sin. Tell me your sin that you're struggling with and come and sit on the front row and I'll preach that sin. I will preach it till I'm blue in the face. Nobody wants to do that. I don't know why. I think it'd be a blast. In the 20th century alone, they say that 108 million people were slaughtered in war and conflict. I can't even wrap my brain around 108 million people for politicians sending other people's kids to die in war. It ain't me. I ain't no senator's son. Here's the kicker. I'm just going to say stuff that it's hard for me to hear. I believe with all my heart that each person slaughtered in the 20th century, that each one of them believed that God was on their side. I read you the countries that had the biggest Christian populations. They're supposedly our enemies. They're not our enemies. People are not our... Our enemy is not flesh and blood. You're telling me that my God can't reach a Taliban? That my God can't reach a Muslim? Either sect of Muslims? Are you kidding me? You're telling me that my God can't reach a Buddhist? That he's not bigger than a statue? That he doesn't have more power to infuse me with the Holy Spirit that will give me the right words and the right things to say at the right moment to the right person? That's when people say, are you him? Are you him? Not Nate, but Jesus. God's always on the side. What about the wars in our communities? The war on drugs, crime. What about the wars in our minds? What about our struggles? What about our mental str- Mental illness is a real thing. Not everything is spiritual. You will get sick in your body. You can get sick in your mind. It is a sickness. What about those struggles? What about those wars in our families, in our homes, in our minds, in our communities? Jesus was different, wasn't he? He was different. He was the God servant. He he was serving and not being served. We can learn so much from that. I follow some of those pages on Instagram that will call out these other ministers and other ministries. But I don't revel in it. Some of it hurts my heart. Some of it they're wrong. I think about where we're at as a community and as a church and as a state and as a nation. And it hurts my soul. It hurts my soul. I've said this before. I just have to say it again. I was working. And and I was working with my business at the airport. And I was speaking with one of the, the firemen there. And I don't know that he knew I was a Christian. I don't know that he 
knows that I'm a pastor. Or I'm just a regular guy. I mean, I've got a uniform on and, you know, I'm working. And he, he says, hey, man. And he described this, this preacher that landed at the airport with his jet. And uh, he said, man, it was crazy. I said, what do you mean? He said, he said, he came in here on his jet, man. And I'm like, oh, here we go. He said, I, I don't have... I don't have a problem. I mean, like, you, you need that. If you're going around the world and preaching the gospel, who am I to say that you shouldn't have one? I stood on a tour bus the other day that was owned by a famous country singer that a Christian musician uses now and travels all over the country. Should he not have that tour bus? Well, we'll just, we won't. <laughs> and and he, 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 says, he, says, he says, man, you ain't going to believe this, but that preacher, he wouldn't get off that plane until his pilots came around and rolled out the red carpet. He wouldn't walk on this tarmac. You know what I said? I didn't say anything. I didn't know what to say. I was speechless. Steve was like, yeah, right. <laughs> I was, man. Like, miracle. I, <laughs> it's, a, it's a miracle. I didn't know what to say. What do you say to that? That's nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like, okay. And uh, I think about Jesus. And I think about Jesus at the Last Supper. With all of his divine authority, he set up from the table, he took out his outer garments and draped himself in a towel. He began to wash his disciples' feet in a basin that he prepared himself. Like, he prepared himself. Like, Bob asked me if I needed water, and I said, yes, I kind of felt bad, because he had to go get it, and I couldn't get it. Like, the Son of Man, bending down to wash the feet of his disciples. He ruled not by the sword, but by the towel. Unfortunately, the world tells us that this, this type of thing doesn't apply to pastors, preachers, doesn't apply to world leaders, doesn't apply to politicians. And spiritually, like morally, ethically speaking, like the leaders of this world, they're on a different set of rules than everyone else. They're, they're the ruling class. They have a different set of rules. But in the kingdom, we are all servants. We're all called to different offices, different positions. I feel bad that every youth camp and the youth camp that we, we help start and, and go to, they're, they're fantastic, but I feel bad myself giving an altar call if you feel like you're called into the ministry. Because I can tell you right now, each and every one of us are called into the ministry. That's right. And I can make as big a dent in this world in my career that I can right here. I probably have. But he ruled by the sword. But to serve, we first have to love. When You remember what Jesus said when they asked him what the greatest commandment was? What did he say? Love. He said, he said to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who's your neighbor? Is that just the guy that lives next door? Well, absolutely not. Your neighbor is anyone that you come across that's in need of service because service is sacrificial love it's so important that jesus said all the law and the commandments hang on loving god with all your heart soul and mind and in loving our neighbors as ourselves so in 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 plain new covenant terms even if we meticulously follow every letter of the law Every single commandment. We haven't begun to follow it. We can't. He can. Love, not the law, not religion, not legalism. It's what defines the kingdom of God. I'm concluding. I'm at my conclusion. Our identity. Remember the mirror? Awesome video, by the way, Jim. 
Our identity is Christ. We're his mirror image on earth. So we've got that mirror. It's reflected and it's reflected Christ. So here we are. I don't want you to remember me. I want you to remember him. I want to be able to walk in that room and someone say, Are you him? We should refuse to let the world define our rules of engagement in the kingdom of God. Legalism shouldn't define our relationship in the kingdom. What's normal shouldn't define us. Remember what we spoke about last week when it came to holiness and association and associations? The Lord says to come out from the world, be separate, touch no unclean thing. But He's called us to be separated by His standard of holiness. Not our standard of holiness, but His. Our associations, I will say it till I'm blue in the face, don't make us unholy. Jesus was still holy when He touched the leper. He was still holy when He called Levi out, when He went to His house, when He ate and drank with sinners. He was still holy. We're called to be a holy people, set it apart, consecrated, dedicated to the Lord and His service. We distort the teaching of holiness when we associate our own pet list of religious do's and don'ts with true biblical holiness. Well, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't gamble, I don't go to Ireton and chase ornery women. That's what my grandpa, every time I left the house, would tell me. Now, Jaybird, don't you drink? Because I don't drink, I don't gamble, I don't smoke, and I don't go to Arnton and chase ornery women. <laughs> he was really old, and I, nothing against Ironton. They were the, absolutely nothing against. <laughs> Ironton was the only, now you can attest to this, was, that was the only place where you could buy alcohol. It was the only place you could buy alcohol. And in his mind, he associated everything that's wrong and every ill of the world with alcohol. So nothing against... I, I go there often. I love the hardware store over there. I, <laughs> absolutely. Whew, man. I can't claim to be holy if I'm not serving others. I can't claim to be holy if I'm not Christ-like. I can't claim to be holy if I'm not full of self-sacrificial love. That's what's peculiar. You, you ever heard it? I've heard it a million times. We're a peculiar people. I, I mean, it's because we spoke in tongues and danced around stuff. That's not what makes us peculiar to the world. What the world sees as peculiar is sacrificial love. That's what's peculiar. You don't see that out in the world. You see a lot of facade. A lot of, well, if you donate to this and I do this and I give to this organization and I'm going to volunteer here, but it's, it's for this. It's to build, build self. But what makes us peculiar is a self-sacrificial Love of people. Sacrifice. And that's not the world system. Super peculiar for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. God that was God flesh that came to earth. You know, he had his earth suit and came to earth. What's peculiar is him bending down and washing the feet of not just his disciples but the one that was about to betray him. In a sense, his enemy. When he served his enemy, when Peter cut off the ear, Malchus's ear, and Jesus bent over and probably didn't grunt like I just did. He, when, when Jesus bent over and back on the enemy he was there at that moment he didn't care about his second amendment rights he didn't shoot first and ask questions later by God 
but he loved me in me. Let me put that back. Let me put that back. Let me make right what my religious compadre made wrong. I'm going to make that right. Let's put it back because it's self-sacrificial love. He wasn't exclusive. Christianity isn't exclusive. Man, people want to talk about church hurt all the time because they've been excluded and all this other kind of stuff or somebody hasn't agreed with what you... No, not church hurt. Go look at church hurt. Church hurt spiritual abuse. But I, I've been hurt in church, but I don't let it define my relationship with Christ. I don't just... I don't stay away from... Listen, I've been hurt in this position through the years. I've had a broken heart from situations that have happened at Kingsway Church. But I kept serving Kingsway Church. And God through Kingsway Church. Because I knew it's where He wanted me to be. I didn't take my toys and go home. I didn't take my ball and go home because I was hurt. Well, Jason got... I'm seeing like God. I would want him to... Oh, little Jason got his feelings hurt. He took his stuff and went home. No, I didn't. We wanted to. Our flesh said go, but we stayed because we knew it was where God would have us to be in serving Him. We have to have an open invitation to the kingdom of God. The ills of this world didn't come from electing the wrong leaders. It didn't come from passing the wrong laws. It didn't come from Hollywood. It didn't come from alternative lifestyles. It didn't come from the government's definition of marriage. That's not where the ills of this world came from. They didn't come from a lack of righteous legislation. These things, in part, come from a lack of revival. We talked about it last week. The world can't have revival. The world needs awakening. We need revival right here in our hearts. I believe that was the first step this morning. I'm happy to step out of the way. And you can say, well, Adam went too long, or he was too loud, or he was out of order. You better be careful saying those things. You better be careful saying those things because God moved in this place this morning. God wants to move in this place every morning. And you think that those youth that he was ministering are not going to take that out and take something and, and go with that? Man, or the lives of the adults that God touched this morning, it does my heart happy. I would have, not, I would have been happy to sit down and not do anything this morning because I'm here to serve. I'd have been a catcher if they'd have asked me. A revival in our hearts. Let me say it one more time. The world needs a repentant, praying church more than it needs a Christian president, moral laws, and worldly leaders that pander to what they call the Christian right. Did you know that you're a voting block now? That's all you are to the worldly leaders is a voting block. That's what you are. You're a voting block. And I don't want to be a voting block. I want to be a kingdom builder. I want to be able to hold people to accountability, not by my standards, but God's standards. And say, you're not going to get my vote or anything else until you repent. Do you have that cricket sound effect that you could play after I say things? Will you serve? Will you be that mirror image? Or will you turn the black side of the mirror that doesn't reflect and just cast a shadow on the ground? Will you be the last defense in your community? Will you be God's mirror image or will you be your own? That's my question to you this morning. I, and I love Ironton. Or, or as old man Banks would call it, and I, that's not being disrespectful calling him that. That's just what people called him. Arton. Arton. I know that I'm going to do my best to be the last defense in the kingdom of God. I know that you guys are kingdom builders. I know that each one of you here this morning are anointed. You've got your callings. You know that Jesus Christ loves you. And you know that I'm here. The leadership's here for you. You are well equipped to do it and to take Christ to this community. 
You know that when you need help, we're here for you. I know that when I need help, you all have been here for us. Not only have we had hurt, but we've had victory at Kingsway Church. We've been blessed by Kingsway Church. We have went through tough times and needed our brothers and sisters in Christ, and they've been there with us with deaths and different things that have happened and tragedies in our family. And God has sent each and every one of you that's helped us and blessed us. So I love you. The Lord loves you. You are a peculiar people. Some are more peculiar than others. I won't say anything about it, Uncle Don. I, uh, you know, who's <laughs> more peculiar or not? Nah, I'm just kidding, but not really. Can I pray a blessing over you real quick and you be dismissed? Last week, Walker was crying at me. And you know what I thought? I would rather that walking man be crying at me than no babies bit Kingsway Church. That didn't put me off my game. It's going to take a lot more than that put me off my game. I want to hear those babies crying. I'll just be honest. I want the kids to be running around up here in worship, dancing, lifting their hands. We can take like some, like we could look at that and we could do some of that, couldn't we? Yeah. You ever see Pastor, if he can't? <laughs> he made up this song years ago, and I sing it sometimes. And it was, it's super West Virginia. And he says, I done done did what they told me to do. I done done this, and I done done that. I done done did what they told me to do. He's using his voice. There's nothing wrong with that. I love it. I'll never forget that. I don't know why, but I won't. Oh, I was praying a blessing so he could leave because it's like... <laughs>